Good morning, saints of God. Morning. Welcome to early morning the kingdom of God in Christ as we come together by way of the grace of God to join again once again for the study of His Word and to seek God early on this Monday morning that He has blessed us to be a part of. Welcome to Christ Kingdom Fellowship. Once again, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Those of you who are joining us by way of our live stream on YouTube and Facebook, thank you for your faithfulness and your uh, continued steadfastness toward God as we uh, meet every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 a.m. This morning, we're going to be looking at Matthew, the sixth chapter, Matthew, the sixth chapter, encouraging you to turn there. Also encourage you to share with your contacts and uh, encourage others to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for our early morning encounter with God in Christ. We're going to get right into it. So join me in a word of prayer as we pre uh, prepare for this lesson. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for another day, another opportunity to say thank you. We give you all the praise and the glory for bringing us through one week and now bringing us into another week. We thank you, Lord, uh, for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lead us and guide us in all truth and we'll be careful to give you the praise on and the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Christ. Amen. All right, praise God. Turn to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Matthew, the sixth chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 25 to 34. And I'm going to start reading because it's quite lengthy. But we want to talk about God's remedy for weary and anxiety. God's remedy for weary and anxiety. In fact, let me, before I even get into the scripture, a weary is uh, not of God. Anxiety is not of God. And so we're going to look at this thing where God talks, uh, where Jesus talks to his disciples about God's remedy for weary and anxiety. I'm going to be reading from uh, verse 25. It says, therefore, I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or uh, for your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look, the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? Which of you, by wearing, can add one cubit or lifespan to his statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say unto you uh, that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and thrown tomorrow into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, uh, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But first, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So uh, when we talk about God's remedy, God's cure, God's treatment for worry, worry is a disease that causes us to be diseased at all times. Think about it. The disease is a, is a diseased. Of, of our minds, a dis-ease of our emotions, a dis-ease of our ability to think properly. And so there's a remedy. God did not give us the spirit of fear. God does not give us the spirit of worry. He has not caused anxiety to come into our lives. These are choices that we make, but worry and anxiety are literally designed as a disease from the enemy to dis-ease us, to cause us to be dis-eased about several things in life that prevent us from doing things that God has called us to do. In fact, when we look at this passage of scripture, we must be mindful of the fact that Jesus is actually, chapter six of Matthew, is actually a uh, continuation of the uh, Beatitudes that begins in chapter five. And so a Beatitude, these Beatitudes, it's been said that these are the attitudes, what Jesus is teaching his disciples are the attitudes, the mindset uh, that, that his disciples are to maintain as they do ministry in his name. And so one of the mindsets that we are to have is a mindset that does not fret, that does not fear, that does not worry, and does not become anxious over things 
that we encounter are things that we desire. And so it's a continuation. In fact, if you look at the text in this context, Jesus is not just teaching them that, that God will provide for them because many times when people see this, they assume that Jesus is saying, well, don't worry, I'll feed you, I'll clothe you, I'll take care of you. But Jesus was prepping them for ministry. And what he is saying, he's speaking to some disciples who were being prepped for ministry and he was letting them know that they will encounter certain things in life that will cause them to question or will cause them to be in doubt, if possibly in the flesh, whether or not God will provide for them because he was calling them into ministry. Their charge and their, their uh, commission and their mission was to go forth into the world and to preach the gospel. But he also told them they would have tribulations. He also told them they would be incarcerated. He also told them people would lock them up. They would uh, end up killing some of them. And he did not want them to worry so much about their physical life that they did not fulfill the purpose for which he had raised them up. In fact, if we go back to the Bible, let's look at uh, chapter six again. But let's look at it from verse, uh, let's start at verse 19. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what is he doing? He's telling them, don't set your heart on wealth. Don't set your heart on riches. Don't set your heart on the things of this world. He says, because wherever your treasure is, what you treasure the most, you will commit to the most. Okay, now let's keep reading. He says, the lamp of the body is the eye. And therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And so this is a continuation of the Beatitudes that were spoken by Christ to his disciples as a means of understanding the kind of attitude they were to possess as representatives for the kingdom of God. So worry and anxiety without a doubt would be a hindrance to fulfilling the will and the purpose for which God had raised them up and called them to be his followers. Uh, uh, also, wearing uh, anxiety uh, gives birth to a life of fruitful, uh, uh, of fearfulness and also a life of doubt, of worry and anxiety causes us to fear, it causes us to doubt, and it robs the believer of his or her purpose and the potential which God has placed in them. You know, the Bible says in, in uh, Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. But when worry and anxiety kicks in, uh, we come to the conclusion we cannot do certain things because that worry and anxiety robs us of our potential in hopes of robbing us of our purpose. And so he's not just making a promise to provide them with food and clothing, but it is an exhortation to his disciples to focus on their mission and not money, uh, to focus on their commitment and not necessarily their comfort, to focus on their purpose and not their own provision, to focus on their assignment and not their anxiety of how they will survive if they fully commit to Christ and the cause of Christ and the purpose for which he has called them to be his disciples. And so, and so Jesus, when he says, do not worry, going back to verse 25, he says, therefore, do not worry. Also in verse 24, he says, there are no man or no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so when he says, therefore, he said, therefore, as a continuation of the words that he has already spoken. So there are two or three things I want to share with you. First of all, worry is a lack of confidence and faith in God to provide as he has promised. Because Jesus says here, you can't serve God and money. He says, don't put your heart on money. And because you can't serve both, you're either going to love one and you're going to hate the other, or you're going to despise one, and uh, you're going to give in to the other. So he says, but but you cannot love both God and money, and then you can't serve God and money. And so therefore, he says, so I say to you, do not worry about your life. 
The first thing he says, do not worry about your life. If you're going to follow me, if you're going to be faithful, if you're going to be committed to me, if you're going to serve me as I've called you for my purpose and my cause, he says, do not worry about your life. In other words, as you commit to me, I'm committed to you. So therefore, as you do what I've called you to do, when you start to fulfill your purpose, then my promise is that whatever you need to fulfill the purpose for which I've called you, he says, I will provide. In fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1 and 3, it says, God has, past tense, given us all things for life and godliness. What does that mean? For life and godliness. Everything we need for life, everything we need to be the godly people he has called us to be. The Bible says upon our coming into the body of Christ, after being saved, God has, past tense, given us everything we need for life and godliness. And so the goal here that Jesus is teaching us is a remedy, this cure for the disease of wearing and anxiety he says that you've got to come to the realization, do not be over-concerned about your life. And if we're honest as human creatures, uh, uh, our personal lives are our number one concern. Our personal lives, we're number one in everything. Jesus says, no, the first prerequisite to discipleship is if any man comes unto me, if any woman comes unto me, you must first deny yourself take up your cross and then follow me. But when you take up your cross, when you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, do understand that I will provide whatever you need as you go on this journey. As you follow me by faith, as you seek me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, I will make sure that everything you need is provided for because what you're doing as representatives of the kingdom, you're literally doing my business. So therefore, since it's my business, I will make sure as my employee, if you will, as my representative, that everything you need will be provided. So he says, now as a part of my kingdom, now as a part of my body, now as a part of my purpose and the cause for which I came into the world, which is to save the world, he says, don't worry about your life. Quit thinking about you. Don't think about you. Have the mindset, the beatitude, the attitude that ought to be. Have that attitude that whatever God has called me into, or let's, let's say like some people say, wherever God calls you, he provides. If God calls, calls you into a place, he provides for you in that particular place. So he says, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, uh, is not your life more valuable than food and the body more than clothing? So he says, he says, think about it. When God sees you, God understands that you're more valuable. He says, don't think about the food and the clothing. He talks about the birds are there. He says, you're more valuable than the birds are there. And says that Solomon in all of his glory will not be arrayed or has not been arrayed even like this grass. And so what we set our eyes on, because when you go back to verse 22, it says the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, that means you stay focused. That means you stay uh, uh, looking towards that which God has called you to do. He says, if the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So what we set our eyes on and what we set our focus on in life will determine whether or not uh, we walk in the light of God's promise or the darkness of our desires. Because when you think about it, remember we said worry is a disease. It's literally something that causes us to be dis-ease. And so as long as we're wary, we're not fully committed to God because we're constantly thinking about the things that we feel we stand in need of. Instead of uh, fulfilling the purpose, like Paul says, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, my whole life, has been surrendered unto him. And so therefore my focus, as he says in Philippians, the third chapter, he says, I, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We set our eyes on the prize. We set our eyes on that which God has called us to do. And so we're constantly focused and we have these blinders on so that we're not distracted from the things, uh, uh, from the things of this world that are constantly bombarding us and uh, uh, trying to lead us away from God and away from his will. We're constantly looking towards that which God has promised and we're constantly fulfilling the purpose which he called us. Let's go to 2 Corinthians real quickly uh, because when you think about the purpose which God has called us in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, 
uh, the Bible helps us understand that this is what we must focus on. In verse 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled. This is what Jesus said. He who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So every believer who has been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ has literally been given the ministry to go out and to reconcile others. He says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or crediting their sins to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And so we have the word of God and we are to go out into the world. We're to share with our friends, we'll share with our contacts and let, let other people know you can be reconciled to God. It does not matter what you did in the past. It does not matter how far you have fallen. It doesn't matter how long you've been committed to a certain act of darkness. He says that we have the ministry or the word of reconciliation and we're to tell people and let people know that God still loves you and God still desires for you to be saved. And by the word of our God, we have the authority to tell someone else that if you will simply come to Christ and surrender your heart, your soul, and your life to him, God will redeem you through Christ and reconcile him or reconcile you to himself. And so let's go back to Matthew, because all of us have the ministry of reconciliation, where it will tempt you to sell yourself short for temporary cash. That's what it talks about in uh, verse 24, he says, you cannot serve God and mammon, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or you will hold to the one and despise the other. If you're always thinking about money, you're not always thinking about ministry. Think about that. If you're always thinking about money, you're not always thinking about ministry. And then on another perspective, if we're always thinking about money, we're not always thinking about our master's will. And so, and so money cannot become our master. Money is a resource that God has given us to fulfill the ministries that we need to fulfill. And then like he's promised here, he takes care of our lives. So he says, as I've called you out of darkness into my marvelous life, as I've elevated you to be one of my servants, as I per uh, purchased you by my blood and brought you into a part of my kingdom, he says, now do not worry about your life. Do not be concerned. Yes, do all the things you have to. You've got to go to work and do all those things. He says, but I open up those doors for you. I will make sure that you have everything you need as you commit myself to, uh, as you commit yourself unto me, then you can be uh, fully persuaded that I've already committed myself fully unto you. So where it will literally cause you to to be robbed of your potential. You will sell yourself short for temporary cash. You will be more concerned about your comfort and your consolation than your commitment to Christ. Uh, because where are the lack thereof? Notice this, where are the lack thereof is an indicator of who we genuinely love and respect. Because he says, either you love God or you love money, or you hold to God or you hold to money. Uh, you despise one and you hold to the other. And so therefore, uh, where it literally determines who we have our greatest love for. And so it's really a disease, if you will, not just a sin, but all sin is a disease, but it diseases us and keeps us from being fully committed unto God. So let's walk through this again. He says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? He says the birds, even the birds of the air, are who are less valuable than us who have been called by God. He says God even takes care of them. They still get up. I mean, they early in the morning, I think we have a saying that uh, 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 early in the morning they rise and, and the early bird gets the worm. So they still get up, but they don't toil. They don't labor. They don't save anything. But every day God feeds them. That's the kind of faith he's telling us we have to have. Because when you go down to verse, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it. It says, which of you by wearing can add one cubit to a statue? How much life do you add by wearing? How much, how much, how many more years do you add to your life when you find yourself being anxious over things that you feel you can't change or can't control? How much, how much more life, uh, uh, and should I say life of bliss, life of value do you add? Because I've said on numerous occasions, life, we do add some things when we wear it. We, uh, it's possible 
to uh, in our anxiety, to literally worry ourselves into losing our hair. We worry ourselves and sometimes to lose our minds. Uh, some people worry themselves into depression. We worry ourselves over things that we cannot change. And he says, if you if if you can understand that you are much more valuable than a bird, you're much more valuable, not only a bird, but the least of birds. He says, if you can understand that you're much more valuable than the least of the birds, and if God provides for the least of the birds, will not God take care of you? Will he not provide for you? Will he not make a way for you? Will he not literally cause that, give you a remedy or a cure for that disease of wearing? Wearing is self-inflicted. That, that's what it is. It's self-inflicted. It's something that we do to ourselves. And why do we do it to ourselves? Because we have this world that tells us this is how things are supposed to be. This is what you should look like. This is what you should have. This is what's going to happen. So fear creeps in. And as a result, we lose our focus and we begin to sink as a result of not being fully committed unto God. He says, if God would take care of the least of the birds, he says, surely God will take care of you. Why? Because you're more viable. You're the one that's been created in the image of God and after his life. You're the one that was given dominion over the world. You're the one that God has set as the apple of his eye. And so therefore, God says, if I take care of the least of the birds, will I not take care of you? Why are you worried about all these things that you will have? Why are you worried about your food? Why are you worried if you're going to have a decent meal? Why are you worried about clothing? Why are you worried about all these things? He says, I've got you, but I've called you because the attitude you ought to have and the mindset that you ought to have is to fulfill my will. And as you fulfill my will, I take care of you. That's what Paul was saying in Philippians 4.19 when he said, but my God shall provide all of your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. He is saying that and he was speaking to the church at Philippi as they were giving and contributing to the ministry. He says, as you have contributed to the ministry, God will also supply your needs. So as you've done what God has called you to do, he says, in, in essence, in return, God will make sure that all you need is provided for. How many years do we waste of our lives or how many years have been robbed or have robbed people of their life as a result of worrying about things that they cannot change? Let's keep reading. He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And not yet, uh, uh, and yet I say unto you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed like one of these. And he uses Solomon, who was one of the richest men that ever lived. In fact, the Bible teaches us and, and research has taught us that Solomon's base income, you know how you work at a, say at a car dealership or something and you're a salesperson, you have a commission, you have a base salary, and then you get commission. Where it says Solomon's base salary was 25 tons of gold on an annual basis. That was his base salary, you know? And so when you think about how wealthy uh, Solomon was, he compares the lily of the fields to Solomon. He says, now if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is, uh, uh, is and then tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And he uses this word, little faith, which means, a lack of confidence in Christ. He says, when you are wearing, when I worry myself, if I allow myself to worry, if I allow myself to become anxious, he says, I'm exhibiting a lack of confidence in Christ. That's what worry does. It's said in essence, I cannot trust God. I cannot trust God to take care of me in this situation. I cannot trust God to make a way out of no way. I cannot trust God. He's it literally, when he says, oh, ye a little faith, he's saying in essence, oh, ye who have a lack of confidence in me. I say all the time that faith is not something we just have to say I'm a person, a man, a woman of faith. Faith says I have fully convinced and persuaded that what God has promised, God will perform. My faith is always in God. It's always in Christ. I'm always believing according to his promise, he will fulfill his promise. I'm not pushing or, or, or striving for my own desires. I'm just living or standing on the promises of God. And so therefore, as I stand on the promises of God, I know his uh, word is true. I know that what I'm pursuing in life will come to pass simply because I've given myself over to him. And therefore, he has promised to provide for me as I fully commit to the ministry. So many people fail to commit because they're simply more concerned about their welfare uh, than their 
calling that God has placed upon their life. God says, if I've called you, don't be concerned about yourself. He says, be concerned about my calling. And as you concern yourself and commit yourself to my calling in your life, I will commit myself to your provision. I will open doors for you. I will make things happen because you can literally cause yourself not only worry, but you can toil and labor to the point to where you run yourself into the ground and still don't accomplish what you want because you're trying to get it yourself. Jesus says, no, follow me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Commit yourself wholeheartedly unto me, and then I will take care of the rest. Let's keep reading uh, as we go down here. It says, now, if God closed the grass, of the field which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe ye, O ye, who lack faith and confidence in me? Therefore, verse 31 says, do not worry. If God will take care of the grass, he'll take care of you. If God will take care of the birds, he'll take care of you. So he says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? He says, for all these things, are the way the people of the world think. And we are to be distinguished from the people of the world because we're no longer a part of that darkness. Remember, he says, we are light. And he uses uh, uh, two adjectives. He says, we're light and we're salt. So therefore, we're the light of the world and the salt of the world. And that means as the light, we illuminate. We help people to understand how to live according to God's standards and God's way. If we're salt, we season people. We literally preserve people. We preserve life. And so therefore, he says, he says, for all these things, the world seeks after, but your heavenly father knows what you need. So he said, if God knows what you need, God will provide your need. You don't have to provide for yourself. He says, you have to go to work and do it, but I'll open that door for your employment. I'll make sure this, I'll make sure that. He said, but just commit my commit yourself fully unto me. And then he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Uh, time is really up right now. So we're going to pick back up on this Wednesday because there's so much more to be said about this. But, but God has a remedy and God has a cure for that disease, that dis-ease that so many of us have chosen to live by, so many of us have inflicted our lives with, he says, get rid of worry. Do not worry about your life. That's the totality of your life. Don't worry about your life. I don't care what happens. Do not worry about your life. When he says, don't worry about your life, he's not just saying about your finances. He's you not know, just saying about your family. He says, anything that's a part of your life, do not worry about it. I've got the remedy. I've got you. Does not God know what you stand in need of? God knows in advance. So he's saying in essence, your father, your heavenly father's got you. Quit worrying, quit being anxious and trust God and put your confidence and your faith back in Christ so that you don't have to walk the floor at night because you serve a God that does not slumber nor sleep. And if God is awake, you can go to rest. You can go to bed. Amen. So we're going to stop right there. And I trust and pray that it's going to help you today as you go begin this week. And I don't know what the week holds, but maybe something's going to come up and try to rob you of your peace, rob you of your joy, rob you of your potential. But do know that regardless of what happens, just know that you can trust God and you don't have to worry about anything. He said, do not worry about anything. And so therefore, let it go, whatever it is. And when it tries to come up, Remind yourself of this word. Pray that the Holy Spirit bring this back to your remembrance. Let it go and do not worry about anything. God's got you because he knows your every need. Amen. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I trust and pray that uh, you will join us again on Wednesday morning as we continue this uh, study and this uh, discussion on not wearing or not being anxious, but trusting the remedy that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Because too many Christians worry about too many things and, and too many things that we cannot change. But we've got to trust God that God is a God of his word and he will perform those things that he has promised. Once again, I want to encourage you, if you have not gotten your uh, tickets for the banquet that the Lord allows to come together on May the 22nd, uh, we're going to encourage you to get one. You can uh, my uh, Kim will post her information again, but that information al has already been posted, but we encourage everyone to get a ticket 
and uh, join us as we celebrate our first year anniversary as Christ Kingdom Fellowship on May the 22nd at 1 p.m. on that Saturday. We're thanking God for all that he's done and all that he's doing. We also want to thank you for your continued faithfulness and giving. And uh, we thank God for those of you that have given by way of our cash app and our tab lead, which is on our uh, website at ChristKF.org. And you've been faithful to that. And we're so thankful for those of you that would like to donate. You can do likewise by going to our website at ChristKF.org. Hit that donate button, scroll down. You can give through Tavly or you can give through our cash app. You can also give through uh, the mail. And that is you can mail it to our uh, place of worship. And that is at 9960 Lynn, L-I-N-N Station Road, Louisville, Kentucky, 40223. Or you can also send it to our P.O. Box at P.O. Box 991145, Louisville, Kentucky, 40269. But whatever you do, continue to support the ministry as we continue to strive. And don't forget what we read in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, we are called to be reconcilers. Christ has reconciled us to God and has given us the word of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation. Until we meet again, may God bless you, may have a smile upon you, stay focused, stay faithful, and stay the course of Jesus Christ. Amen.